Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr Zoe Jacobs. Today I'm joined by Professor Richard Lampitt for the first of a two-part special all about plastics and the effects that they have on our ocean. Welcome Richard, thanks for joining us today. How are you? Absolutely fine, a pleasure to be here. Good, thank you. <coughs> um, so first, I'd really love to hear about your career at the NOC, um, how long you've been here, your journey towards leading the microplastics team. Well, of course it's a terribly long career <laughs> <laughs> so I've been here about 40 years or so oh, wow, and, really? yes that's right well on and off um, <laughs> so it's been a long one and um, starting off as a benthic biologist of sorts and then working on downward particle flux because I thought I need to know what about the economy of the deep sea floor and uh, that took up quite a lot of the career um, tampering around with also with uh, geoengineering okay. and fixed point observatories and yeah. various other things. And then about seven years ago, I thought, really, we need to have some better information about plastics. There was just such a lot of nonsense being talked mm. in, the, in the media, some very bad research being carried out. And it just seemed to me that we needed to have evidence-based decisions uh, on how dangerous this material was? Was it really likely to cause a collapse of the marine ecosystems? Mm. Or was it just something that didn't look very nice on the beaches? So the, there was an awful lot of hype in the media, which I didn't like very much. So I set up this team in order to try and do some good research, mm. to, to really try and understand what harm is this doing? How much is the actually in the environment? How long does it last? All, all the sort of questions that we'll probably come on to, mm. um, to try and get a, a better foundation and to get away from this, this fear that this was a terrible, terrible material. So yeah. that was the sort of background to it. Yeah. And that's, and that's developed and we've got various sort of contracts and we'll probably come on to some of those in a, in a bit as well. But it was, it, w it was really based on this appalling amount of mm. research that we've been done and the terrible media hype. I wanted to get away from. Yeah, there has been a lot of media hype around plastic. I mean, for what, at least a decade or so, maybe longer. Um, so how about, um, that's quite interesting, talking about the media. So how do you think your perception and your team's perception uh, to plastic contamination has changed over the last decade or so? Well, actually, it has changed quite significantly because, as I said, the idea was to do some good research so that we can make some sensible comments and well-based comments and I at the back of my mind I thought that probably it wasn't going to turn out to be a serious problem I I that was my hunch mm. um and that if we did good research we'd find that actually this material didn't last very long wasn't actually very dangerous at the concentrations we find it so since then um I and and the rest of the team have actually come to the not a conclusion but we're coming round to the view that actually this is a bit more of a concern um, and some of the data that are coming out shows that some of the certainly the additives the things that are added to plastics they're quite nasty materials and they do do some fairly nasty things to to organisms and mm. and to humans so I'm becoming a little more concerned about it than I was seven years ago when I set this up, mm. um, which isn't really the right trajectory. You know, I'd hoped, I'd hoped something better and that we could focus on, uh, I mean, some of the really serious environmental issues such as, as hydrocarbon use and global warming and things. Uh, I'd hoped that we could actually put this to rest a little bit. Mm. Um, but that isn't the way I'm thinking now. Right. It's quite scary, really, isn't it? No, that's not a word I'd use, actually, no? scary. I don't think we should be scared. <laughs> we just need to have good information yep. so that we, we can make evidence-based decisions. Yes, and very those are, So being scared, I think there's an awful lot of people get very scared, yeah. and I sort of tend to stand back from that sort of terminology and say, don't be scared, just take action. Yeah. And that's the sort of way I like to yeah. think about it. That kind of leads me on to my next uh, <clears> question. I was going to ask what the what you think the public's perception has been like, because there has been a lot of kind of scaremongering, if you like, mm. by the media. Do you think that's changed at all recently? Um, I don't know whether it's changed in the... Um, has it changed? It's, it certainly has 
been enhanced, people have become more concerned, more scared as a result of seeing these terrible images, which I absolutely find appalling myself, yeah. of seabirds and, and sea mammals which have been strangled and, and you know, birds which have got toothpicks and things stuck inside their, their gullets and things. Um, and I, I think there has been enormous amounts of, of concern and anxiety about it. Um, which has not shown any signs of decreasing. Mm. Um, the good side of that is, of course, that it provides pressure. It puts pressure on politicians, on yeah. industry, and on individuals to do the right thing. Yeah. We'll come on to that in, in a bit, what is the right thing. But, mm. but it puts pressure on people to do the right thing, and that, so I think that's very good. Yeah. Um, but I don't like, particularly when it comes to the young, um, to children, for children to be frightened and to feel that uh, everything is falling apart. And when we get these sort of statements that that are banded around that the marine ecos ecosystem is uh, is collapsing as a result of the plastic contamination, there really isn't evidence for that. Um, that isn't the case. I mean, the, what we do by taking out fish is much more fundamental change um, by fishing an awful lot it changes the marine ecosystem yeah. radically so i'm uh, public perception and understanding has certainly been a strong and positive uh influence and pressure um but as i said just now it's not a matter of being frightened or scared it's a matter of just taking the right action yeah. in one's personal life and mm. and pressurizing politicians and, and and industry and i think that's there are some good things of come out of this yeah um yeah no i definitely agree um <coughs> as a nation for myself i always try to make um certain effort i feel a certain duty to try and um make changes to my daily routine to try and alleviate the kind of uh, plastic contamination that we see um and i know many of my family and friends who aren't scientists also do the same um and i'm sure many uh, listeners are also thinking about ways that they can um alleviate that plastic mm -hmm. contamination so have you got any any advice or any examples of things that um, things that people can do to cut back on plastic? Um, yes, there are some very very simple simple ways, and some of those are, have already been implemented by things like the plastic bag tax, you know, which has reduced some of the some of the usage by eighty or ninety percent, and that that's great. But in our daily lives, it's really a matter of trying to think about what we do with plastic items. So the the simple mantra is is uh, used many times. Well, first of all, don't buy unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, use many times. Um, make sure that they are recycled yeah. if they, they're put into the right, right recycling system. Um, and so being mindful at all times that mm -hmm. there are ways that we can do in our personal, things we can do in our personal life which reduce the amount of plastic which is going into uh, in, into the, the the natural environment, going into to waste tips, to municipal dumps is a completely awful way uh, to use to dispose of something. This is absolutely what we should be avoiding. And some of those things are difficult. For instance, some of the plastics that we commonly have uh, have got multiple types of plastic on them, and that makes them very difficult to recycle. So if you've got a, a, a plastic bottle which has got a cap made of something different, then that's difficult. Mm -hmm. So we need to be mindful about those sorts of tricky aspects of plastics. And then the pressure is, of course, on industry to come up with ways of recycling efficiently and effectively and manufacturing things in the first place which are uh, don't have those sorts of mixtures. Mm -hmm. So... So this combination of, of uh, factors is something which is which is pretty crucial in making mm. sure that we don't uh, release the the large amounts that we're releasing at the moment from the ocean point of view. Of course, yeah. it's we're talking about ten to twenty million tons per year is going into the ocean, so it's it's quite a lot of material. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's the, there are things that we can do, mm -hmm. and and people are doing that. Yes. I mean, the flip side to the plastic bag tax, of course, is that we've got an incredible increase in the number of bags for life which are produced. And so that's not actually a very smart 
move. So mm. people talk about this 80 or 90 percent reduction in the plastic bags. Mm. But then there's a colossal production. Mm. I haven't got the figures off the top of my head, mm. but it's enormous increase in the bags for life. So I'm like, no, that isn't what's supposed to happen. The bags for life. I mean, I think we've got something like 10 bags per life per member of the population. Yeah. What? Huh? Yeah. That isn't, that doesn't quite make so sense, does it? <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> no. So anyway. Yeah. So you mentioned just now about the um, the kind of plastic bag tax and things like that. Do you know if that's actually made any significant impact on the amount of plastic bags that have been washed up on beaches or anything like that? Is there any way that we can actually measure if that policy has actually been worthwhile? Um, I don't know. But in that we've had this 80 or 90 percent reduction, mm. it clearly has. And yeah. I actually had some wages with some friends. Uh, who said, no, this isn't going to make any difference. Mm. It's whatever. It started off as 2p and then went up to 5p yeah. or something. And uh, I said, no, I think it will make a difference. Maybe it'll cause a 20% reduction. Huh? What? 80 or 90%. Yeah. And most importantly, I think, is not actually just that reduction. It's this change in the mindset of the population mm. that we should not be just throwing things away yes. once we've picked them up from the, the supermarket or whatever, go home, throw it in the bin. We should not be doing this. Yeah. And so that change of mindset is the thing which is it's slow, but it is happening. And I think it, that's a very positive, positive effect of this. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. Um, so can you tell us what's currently on the agenda for the microplastics team here at NOC? Right. Well, <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there's quite a few things going on. Yes, please. And, tell us all. Uh, <laughs> no, some of them are a bit secret, you know. Uh, so, no, they're absolutely <laughs> not secret. Everything is in there. <laughs> um, so there are, there, are, there are two real questions uh, which are very simple. I mean, the questions about plastics actually are very simple. And the most straight first of those is how much is there? How much is actually mm. in the environment? And that may sound like a very simple question, and it is, but actually we don't have a very good answer mm. about that. So we're spending... So once you know how much is there, then you ask the questions of what sort of material it is, uh, how did it get there, how long does it last? So we're spending still quite a lot of effort on that side of things. Um, we did a transect of the um, right way down the Atlantic to look at the the uh, abundance of microplastics. So those are the ones less than about a millimetre. And, mm -hmm. um, and um, we found there was an awful lot more there than we thought there would be. In fact, we found there was more there than we thought we'd ever put into the ocean. Oh, well, well OK. <laughs> so that was a bit scary. Yeah. And we've still got to bottom that one out. We've right. still got to do more work on that. So the, the very simplest thing is how much is there? Mm. So at the moment, we've, we've got projects, um, European projects, uh, working in the River Thames. So going right into the upper reaches of the River Thames mm -hmm. to find out how much plastic's there, mm -hmm. how's it flowing down the, the River Thames and getting into the Southern North Sea, um, as well as, as, as work in the Atlantic. So those are sort of quite simple parts of it. Um, and we're obviously, we're looking at, where is this stuff? Is it in the, the animals? So we're sampling the animals in these different environments and the sediment and in the water. Um, and the second bit of it is how toxic is it at the concentrations that we find it? Mm. And that's the thing which has been really missing from a lot of the research is, I mean, if you take, for instance, you might take a jar and you put some animals into it and then you put 10 million times the concentration you'd ever, ever find anywhere in the environment. And then you look to see what happens to those animals. Mm. Ah, they're not going to get be very happy because they can't feed because of all this plastic. And that's the sort of research which has been carried out in the mm. past. And so if you say you're going to do research, and, and the, the, the justification for it is, well, we want to see a result. Uh, yeah. No, that's not we sh what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. We should be doing... So that's the, the flip side of the coin. Right. First side is how much is there. Mm -hmm. And the second si side is, is how much damage does it do? Mm -hmm. How toxic is it at those concentrations? Yeah. And that's actually really difficult research, particularly when you're talking about long-term exposure. Yeah. And that's really, really hard. So we're we're doing a little bit of that, and some of our colleagues elsewhere in Europe 
uh, are doing that. I'm talking about Europe in its geological sense. Yes. We are part of Europe. <laughs> uh, and um, so um, what is it? how much damage does it do at those concentrations? Mm. So that's one of the programs that we're involved with. Another one is looking at in the North Atlantic, mm -hmm. where we've been working most over the, over the years, looking at how much of this material is settling down. So we've got what are called sediment traps. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of like rain gauges, big cone like mm -hmm. this, and they collect material as it's settling down. And so and we've got data, we've got samples from many, many years, uh, like 30 years of samples. So we are... Uh, analyzing this mm. to see how how this material sinks through the water column. I mean, people tend to think, oh, plastics float, don't they? Actually, they don't. Mm. There's quite a lot of them that sink. Mm. And um, so we want to know how much is sinking and has this changed over time? Um, so that's that's a pretty important part of the this this whole process of understanding how it gets where it is. Yeah. And uh, what are the processes that occur? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I should have said these sediment traps are at three thousand meters depth, yeah. so they're quite deep in the yeah. water column. The water column is about five thousand meters. Yeah. So we're talking now about the plastics that we can't actually even see. As you say, we think of plastic as floating, so we have all the like, kind of plastic bags and straws and everything else floating around at the top that we can actually see, and that that's kind of making our beaches not look very, <laughs> very nice. But um, there's actually a lot more sinking all the oh, way down absolutely. and that's <clears throat> and that's actually the kind of stuff that we need to understand yeah. to get a handle on yeah i mean the stuff that's floating is is probably less than one percent oh wow okay. um and the big plastic bags big big plastics lumps that you see on the surface of the ocean and people get very concerned about that's a very small yeah. proportion but it is the if you like um, the feedstock mm. for the smaller yes. particles because they then break down as a result of wave activity and sunlight mm. and form the smaller particles, which I've always felt that's much more likely to be where the real damage is. Yes. Even though you look at these ghastly pictures of, of mammals mm. getting strangled, actually the real damage is most likely to be in the small particles. Mm. And with some of these, once you get below... Uh, 10 microns and a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter so mm. these are pretty small yeah, can't really see tiny. them yeah. yep can't see them with a naked eye and once the particles get down to that sort of size they can actually cross the the gut wall so if right. they get ingested then they pass through the gut wall and they can end up in mm -hmm. in the livers and and the the, the tissues mm. of organisms and that's really where there is the potential for harm yeah some serious no worry there yeah. and i guess that if it's if it's getting into fish i guess it could be going up the food chain as well into the large mammals and us yep. if, we, if we are yes fish uh, eaters. yeah uh, absolutely right um and the plastic itself is probably not going to cause cause very much harm mm. but it is actually the things that are added to it Right. Some of which are, are pretty nasty chemicals mm. and they may be plasticizers to make the make the plastic nice and, and, and bendy. Um, or flame retardants, mm -hmm. things like that, which are added to plastics. And some of those are fairly nasty substances, even though in small quantities, small concentrations. Um, and if they're still in the plastic and then they get into the tissue, then you'll start to talk about, well, that could actually cause some mm. uh, some harm. Um, and as I said just now, with the toxicity side, when you're talking about long-term exposure, then things are, the experiments are very difficult to do. It's mm. really hard, particularly if you, I mean, you might think of exposing a community for several years or multiple generations mm. of a small organism uh, to very low concentrations. And you say, ah, how do you actually find out how much damage that's doing? Mm. When I mean, if you've got some toxin in in the, in the environment, the normal way of, of looking at this is you, you do a whole lot of experiments and you th see how many organisms die uh, or how long it t what concentration kills yeah. half the organisms. And that's terribly simple, and that's great. But if you're just going to say, so what happens if you expose this uh, multiple generations of an organism to very low levels? What does it do? Mm. 
and how does it harm the reproduction, the health yeah. uh, of the whole ecosystem? So that's that's those are really really hard uh, types of research to carry out, but tremendously important that we get Absolutely. ways of doing it. Absolutely, I've seen a few studies actually over the last couple of years of kind of things like. Um, an orca has unfortunately washed up dead on the beach somewhere in, around the UK actually and they found ridiculously high levels of, se- of some of these kind of harmful chemicals yep. that you've been yep. talking about yep. and Absolutely. maybe actually that could be cause of death so I guess these kind of studies are starting to filter their way through but as you say they're quite difficult quite difficult to tackle um, mm. and I guess time will tell which is kind of worrying as well because it's just going to continue i guess yeah that's right so and there's certainly some of these compounds um i mean one which is very very widely used um in all sorts of sorts of areas is it's called bisphenol a Mm. and it's a compound which is added to plastics and it's very widely used and you in places you wouldn't see it. I mean, the inside of food cans, for instance, have got also got often got material mm. which is high in bisphenol A, clothing, shop receipts, mm. um, dental fillings. They've all got this in. Gosh, yeah. And this is something which we call a, an endocrine disruptor. Mm. So it's it behaves like an estrogen. And it's, it's kind of fairly nasty stuff. Um, but it's really, really valuable in producing all sorts of different types of, mm. of plastics. And only just recently, um, I read a paper, reviewed a paper, in fact, which was talking about the uh, concentration, a bit looking at the concentrations in pregnant women mm-hmm. and finding that at, so these were not women who were living in particularly polluted in areas mm. or had unusual lifestyles or whatever. And what it turned out was that the concentrations that they were uh, finding um, affected the birth weight of their children. Oh wow! There you go. Um, of actually, funny enough, of only of the male birth weights okay. were affected by this. Interesting. So then you start saying, "Wow!" So here's something at very, very low concentrations, yeah. very widely used, yeah. and it is having a direct influence yeah. on on the human population yeah clearly and this is the kind of thing that's i guess becoming a bit more recognizable because i actually i often see in the supermarkets for kind of reusable bottles and tupperware kind of bpa free and that's the kind of thing that we're talking about right yeah so, absolutely so right. i guess the news <laughs> is kind of filtering down yep. um and hopefully that's the kind of thing that will be eradicated maybe but i guess it's difficult isn't it because it's quite useful yeah absolutely <laughs> which is the problem we have yeah. with plastic in general right <laughs> yeah and it's fantastic stuff I, I, I mean i usually start off by saying how wonderful this material is <laughs> you know it's, it reduces and, and people say oh well we've just got to reduce plastic uh, cut out plastic packaging okay so what are you going to do about cucumbers mm. which if you don't wrap them up in plastic a third of them go go rotten before they get to the into onto your plate oh, oh tricky. right so the difficult and it's a it's an absolutely fabulous material mm. from the point of view of health, uh, uh, economy, yeah. uh, making things light so they're, they're cheap in terms of energy yeah. to transport. Exactly. And people say, oh, well, we should be using glass bottles. Mm, they're very, very mm. expensive to transport and yeah. therefore re- releasing, lo- needing lots of hydrocarbons to transport them, releasing exactly. lots of CO2 as a result of transporting oh, these very heavy things. So, so <laughs> you start off by saying, no, it's amazing stuff. Yeah. Let's just get it right yes, and use exactly. it in the right way yeah exactly yeah mm-hmm. so is there anything um anything coming up i know i know all the research is very important but is there anything that you're currently involved in or coming up that's particularly exciting in your group um i i think probably well the two programs which are, are running the, the thames and north sea yeah. and the the atlantic are certainly the things that i I'm most excited mm. about at the moment, and they've only just started. Oh, great! So they will be. It'll be three or four years before we really can start to say make some conclusions from those. But I'm really hoping that they they develop, and and there are signs that they will be developing into other sorts of uh, of programs. Um, obviously, things are money limited, and yes. that's a real shame. I know. I would. I mean, 
That's if the if find me a scientist who doesn't say they're short of money. Well, if if you do, <laughs> then they're probably not being ambitious enough. Yeah. <laughs> they're probably not thinking. <laughs> so those are the, those are the programs which are taking much of the team. Yes. Um, I'm when you talk to Mike, you'll probably find that there's yes. there's there's a different perspective from mm-hmm. him as well. There's some really nice work that he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, uh, uh, those are the things which I'm really focusing on yeah. at the moment. There's quite a lot of enthusiasm for using, um, uh, d- for doing citizen science, which is where mm-hmm. you, you get the general population to become involved in the work. And I, I think there's potential for this, and there's some discussions that I'm having at the moment on that. Um, there's two aspects to that. One is that it's sometimes very hard to train people mm-hmm. to do good collecting. And that means it's it's actually quite difficult to get good data, yeah. particularly when you're talking about these very small particles mm-hmm. where it can so easily get contaminated. Um, the other side of citizen science, which is in a way perhaps a bit more attractive, is that it engages people in the scientific endeavour and therefore they become mm. signed up, if you like, to this is the way we should be getting yeah. data which can then be used to make changes to policy, mm-hmm. make changes to pressure on, on industry and such yeah. like. So exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about citizen science from, from mainly from that second yeah. point of making sure that the general public uh, are, are signed up to this way of finding out about things. And mm-hmm. that's really, really valuable. Um, so I'm quite, quite excited from that point of view. And there are quite a lot of changes going on in legislation, both EU legislation mm-hmm. and the UK, um, which have been, which are all moving in the right, uh, the right direction. Mm. I mean, in the EU, we yeah. have, have the single use directive, which, mm-hmm. although because we're no longer in the EU, we're not obliged to to follow. But the the UK is also taking some, making some good steps good. in the right direction. Good. Um, it's faster. I I was, uh, but but there you go. That's uh, <laughs> an industry too are responding. Yeah, good. It's good. So overall positive outlook. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm I I am a bit positive. So. Certainly that we are doing things in the yes. right in the right way, mm-hmm. and the the reduction in export as well mm-hmm. of, of our waste, which yeah. is now cannot be carried out to a non OECD, the, the mm. developing country. You yes. can't just dump your stuff. Of course, yeah. And this is a very positive change, uh, which has sort of been stimulated by China stopping uh, the import mm-hmm. of of, um, uh, of Western waste. Yeah. Um, and so these are these are good things, mm-hmm. but still we need to have that basic understanding or before we can really make evidence based decisions. We yeah. need to have a basic understanding of how much is there? How's it getting there? How does it change? Uh, how long does it last? And what is the damage that it does at yeah. the concentrations we find? Yeah, no, exactly. So um, this <laughs> I really wish we could have more, more research of a high quality. And I've actually been a bit surprised how difficult it has been to mm-hmm. get funding. Because yeah. I've had a long history of working in European, <coughs> European projects and uh, and and UK ones and always funny if you've got a good idea and a good question mm. then the money comes in and you can do yeah. it and this is turning out to be harder than I thought um, but we'll get there yeah hopefully mm. fingers crossed <laughs> yeah 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 that's right yeah. well I think that's what we've got time for today so thank you very much for joining mm. us well thank you um, Zoe <laughs> thank you um, And if you'd like to find out more about the NOx research into plastics, please visit our website noc.ac.uk. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast app. Join us very soon for the second part of this two-part plastic special, where I'll be joined by another NOC expert, Dr Mike Clare. See you then.